It's a real honor to be here and to tell you my story. Um, I am from a small town in the United States in Loveland, Colorado. And uh, I kind of hit the jackpot with my parents because they really cared about raising humans. They cared about this job a lot. And my dad demanded us to uh, be excellent. And my mom really pounded into our heads that we needed to be good people and make the right decision even when our back was against the wall. And um, so I kind of spent my early life in a bliss. And then my brothers were born, and they ruined everything. And they ruined everything not just by being born, but because they were born prodigies. And in my family, school and sports really mattered. And my, my middle brother came out kind of just a genius from the get-go. He was like playing chess at age four and testing out of his math class and into mine and getting better scores on tests. And he went on to become a Harvard-educated cardiothoracic surgeon. My youngest brother was a sports prodigy. At 19 years old, he was number one in the world in mobile skiing. Um, he ran a 4.340. And uh, he went to two Olympics, won six world championships in mobile skiing. And then when he decided he wanted to retire from his ski career, he casually went to the NFL Combine and got drafted fifth round of the Philadelphia Eagles. <laughs> this is my dinner table. And um, so at my dinner table, I was never going to be the smartest or most talented person in the room. And that kept me up at night, because I wanted a significant life, and I wanted to matter in the ways that I saw my brothers matter. So I came up with this plan that I would just never quit. I would just keep going at it, school, skiing, whatever it was. And hopefully, that amount of uh, you know, tenacity would make up the, di the difference. And the first place I applied this to was mogul skiing. I wanted to go to the Olympics, too. And I didn't have the natural talent that my brother had. Um, but I had a lot of heart. And at 12 years old, I got diagnosed with scoliosis. And the doctors told me a couple really annoying things. One, they told me I had to get surgery, because if I didn't, I would become disfigured and slowly suffocate to death. And the second thing they told me was the surgery consisted of taking bone from my hip, fusing the top 11 vertebrae together to make a solid bone out of my spine, and putting two metal rods along the sides. And this was kind of a problem for me because I was a mogul skier, so this is not like the ideal body situation. <laughs> um, and then they told me my ski career was over and I should pick a new sport. Mm, but I was 12 years old and I was already pretty well rooted in not listening to adults. So I let myself heal for that year and I was back on the snow. And for the next eight years I worked really hard. I uh, showed up to training early and I left late and I suffered constructively through pain and discomfort. And at 19 years old, I made the US ski team. At 20, I was third overall in North America. And at 21, I made it all the way to the Olympic qualifiers. And I stood on top of that mountain thinking, my whole life comes down to this moment. You know, I was 21. Um, but you believe it. And um, this is what happened. I tripped on a stick. <laughs> and that happens in life sometimes metaphorically and sometimes actually. And when I came to, the doctors said I was really lucky to walk away and that I probably wouldn't the next time. So I retired that day from mogul skiing and I tried to go back to school. I was in my last year at the University of Colorado. I was in the process of applying to law schools. I had just taken the LSAT. If you saw the movie, full disclosure, Aaron Sorkin massively inflated my LSAT score. <laughs> but I did pretty well and I was applying to good schools. But I sat in that classroom in Colorado, and I could see the mountains, and my heart was broken. So I decided I was going to take a year off to be a kid and be warm. And I proposed this plan to my family, and they swiftly turned it down. But I went anyway. So I, got, I went to LA. And I kind of needed to get a job the second that I arrived. So I applied at this restaurant in Beverly Hills. And on the application, it said, must have fine dining experience. Well, I was from Loveland, Colorado. Like, the nicest restaurant I'd ever been to is at Chili's, you know? <laughs> but I lied. <laughs> and uh, apparently that doesn't fly in Beverly Hills. Apparently you really need that experience. So two weeks later, I got fired. My boss came into the office and said, you're the worst waitress we've ever seen, ever. Um, but we see that you show up early, and you leave late, and you work hard. So I'm offering you a job as my personal assistant. 
Now this guy was terrifying. He was very unstable, hot-headed, uh, you know, say a little psychotic. But I was running out of money, and I didn't want to go home, so I said yes. And working for him was demeaning at times. It was frustrating. But he came into the office one day, and he said something that seemed pretty benign at the time, but that would change my life forever. He said, I need you to serve drinks at my poker game. Are there any poker players in here? <laughs> it's enough for a game after, no? Just kidding, I'm retired. <laughs> um, I didn't know anything about poker. Um, so I went home and I Googled things like, what kind of music do poker players like to listen to and what do they eat? You know, I wanted to do a good job. And I made this really embarrassing playlist with songs like The Gambler on it. And I bought a cheese plate at the supermarket and I showed up and waited for the players to arrive thinking, overgrown frat boys, I got this, right? So imagine my surprise when Ben Affleck walked in the room and Leonardo DiCaprio and the head of one of the biggest movie studios and a politician that will remain unnamed. And um, one after the other after the other, sort of these masters of the universe walk in the room. And of course, I mean, I'm mortified at my playlist that's playing, you know, and the cheese plate. And, but I have this moment, I have this light bulb moment. This is not an opportunity that a 22-year-old girl from Loveland, Colorado gets. This is an opportunity to build a network, to have access to information, capital, and power. And, I really wanted to stay in this room. And then at the end of the night, because they tip in chips, I basically got tipped $3,000 for refilling Diet Coke, so I was in. <laughs> and then over the next weeks, months, I went home and I learned the game of poker. I learned the rules and the objectives. And then I studied the client. I wanted to know why these guys, with their access to anyone, anything in the world, why they ritualistically wanted to come in this room with this cheese plate and play poker. And what I landed on is um, it was, they didn't want things anymore. They wanted experiences. They wanted escapism. They wanted to be part of something, a community. And um, so I started to really kind of pay attention to these things and build on them. I formed alliances. I inserted myself in their life and solved problems I wasn't asked to solve. And the players took note, and they tried to hire me away, and my boss got really threatened. And one day he said, I'm taking this game away from you. You need to come back to the office and pick up my dry cleaning. And, you know, I couldn't do that. I made a lot of money, and I saw clearly how I could turn this into a business for myself. I also saw how poker could be like my Trojan horse that would enable me to infiltrate any subset of society. There were nine seats at a table. I could seat them with luminaries from any industry. I saw a huge opportunity here. So I knew I had to take a risk. So um, based on what I had kind of observed about this game and what I know about experiences, uh, that all the variables matter, I planned a game. I moved it to the penthouse suite at the Four Seasons because I wanted them to walk in and kind of feel like James Bond for a night. Um, <clears throat> I hired beautiful people and had them memorize everyone's drink order, everyone's food order, things about their life. Because what I've seen in the world is no matter who someone is, they want to feel seen, heard, and remembered. Um, I raised the stakes because I wanted to make noise and the economics matter. I raised the stakes from a 10 to a $50,000 buy-in. And then I invited everyone except for my boss. <laughs> and um, the game went off really well. And for some reason, even though I was going up against the billionaire boys club, they gave me the game. So for the next six years, I ran this game. I made millions of dollars. I made an incredible network. I had. Uh, a great adventure, an insane education, and then I ran into a problem. One of the players, who is a very, very well-known A-list actor, um, really had a f was obsessed with this game. And not only obsessed with the game, but obsessed with winning, and was always constantly trying to figure out how to get an edge. And ultimately, after five and a half years, he decided to try to get that edge by cheating. He was colluding with another player. He staked that player and they were playing with the same money, and, and that's cheating. And I knew I had to call him out on this. Um, I couldn't allow this to happen, and I knew that that was going to be a very risky call. This is someone with a big ego, uh, a lot of social currency, and um, a, a true addiction and obsession to, 
taking money from people, which he called crushing their souls. <laughs> so um, so I, I put my foot down, and I was right. He went behind my back. He made up some lies. He took the game from me, and the way I found out was a couple hours before my game, he called me and said, you're screwed. Don't show up. You're done. So <clears throat> like tripping on a stick, in a moment, everything changed. And I could have gone away. I had made millions of dollars. I was a wealthy girl. I had a really insane network. I could have gotten hired at a lot of places. I could have started something myself and raised a lot of capital. But I was pissed. And I was on fire with the injustice of it all. And so I decided that not only was I not going to go away, I was going to go bigger. And I was going to build an empire. And I was going to do that in New York City because I really thought that Wall Street was a great place to find gamblers. And, uh, <laughs> and um, the only problem with my genius plan was it was 2008. Not the best time to uh, start the biggest high stakes poker game in the world on uh, Wall Street. But I just focused on the win, I activated my network, and um, I took trips to New York, and, and then I, I went to Vegas and made deals with the casino hosts. I said, look, you guys, I have 20 of the biggest gamblers in the world. I'll bring them in for, for events. You can have the contacts. And in exchange, I need to know the biggest poker players in New York City. Um, I went to the clubs. I incentivized the bottle service girls. And by the end of 2008, I had built the biggest private high stakes poker game in the world. It was a $250,000 buy-in. And this time, I was not going to be replaceable. This time, I was going to make sure no one could just take this from me. And I needed them to be enmeshed with me financially, and so I became the bank. I extended, I vetted the players, I extended credit, um, I settled the games, so people came and played, and instead of having to collect for weeks and weeks and weeks from slow players, I settled it. Um, it was a huge value add for them, and it also made them hard to go anywhere else. Um, <clears throat> and that might seem like a really crazy risk to take, but my thesis was that uh, the rep, it was reputational suicide to stiff this game, number one. And number two, if they had no alternative, if, there, if I built the best game where you could play for the highest stakes, where you could sit with celebrities, a game where movies were getting made and hedge funds were getting formed and you could get paid right away, they wouldn't have an alternative. And this theory really worked um, until I became reckless, but I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> it's coming, though. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, I, I had a redemption moment, and it was very sweet. But something changed in me in New York. And what had previously been about having guts and heart and entrepreneurship and going big became largely about greed, and it was never enough. So every moment I wasn't running this huge poker game, I was out recruiting for smaller games, PLO games, Omaha game. It doesn't matter if you don't know what that is. It's just a different form of poker. And, um, until I had a game running every day and every night, and I had millions of dollars on the street. I stopped sleeping. I stopped communicating with my family because they didn't approve of what I was doing. Um, I stopped having meaningful relationships. I was really starting to slip. I started doing drugs to stay up, and drugs to come down, and drugs to address this kind of increasing loneliness and emptiness. It was all poker all the time. And um, besides myself getting reckless, there was other things happening. Back in LA, there was a player named Brad, and we named him Bad Brad. On account of in two and a half years, I never saw him win a game of poker. He might not have won a hand. And he was great for business, man. Everyone wanted to play with Bad Brad. But it started to wear on me morally. And I pulled him aside and I said, Brad, this game might not be for you. You know, and he said, please don't take my seat. I love the guys. I just, I love it. Can, and I said, can I get you a coach? And he's like, yeah, maybe, you know. But something started to happen at the table. Bad Brad would splash all this money, and, you know, he was losing millions of dollars a year. But then he started talking about his returns. And everyone decided he was some sort of idiot savant and started investing with him. So Bad Brad raised $30 million at the table. He lost five. Turns out he was running a Ponzi scheme. So um, we all thought we were getting one up on him, but he was actually hustling us. 
When he got arrested by the feds, he was very forthcoming about this Molly Bloom character who had lured, her in, lured him into her poker game. He became a gambling addict, and that was you know, his downfall. And while his testimony didn't hold a lot of weight, two things happened. The deposition was leaked to the tabloids, and now I'm on the radar of the West Coast feds. Back in New York, I was about to get a little Scorsese. <laughs> so, um, I had just recruited the recruitments of a lifetime, I thought. They were Russians from Brighton Beach. <laughs> Could have used you guys back then. <laughs> Little Loveland didn't know about that. And um, so I, you know, I had private investigators that would vet these guys within an inch of their life. And their stories checked out, and they were at, you know, they, they, they were, uh, they fit at the table. They were personable and educated and, you know, could talk business and had a very legitimate story. Turns out they were running the biggest auto insurance fraud scheme in New York City history and had deep ties to the Russian mob. So don't ever hire me to recruit for your companies. <laughs> Accidentally recruited the Russian mob. Um, but the games got massive with these guys. I saw someone lose $100 million in a night. Um, he owns a bank, so be careful out there. <laughs> uh, and um, so, you know, things are starting. And, and so the, the, the East Coast feds were on to these guys, so they started listening to my phone calls as well. And um, <clears throat> the last sort of thing that happened was, uh, you know, the mob had all Italian this time. Um, <laughs> we go big. Uh, the, the Italian mob was really, uh, really, really runs gambling in New York City. And for two years, I didn't hear a peep from them. And, uh, you know, I, I thought maybe that's something that's exaggerated in the movies. But I just didn't hear anything from them until uh, around 2010. And I had a driver who doubled as security for me. And um, I trusted this guy. He worked for me for four years. And he said one day, you know, I drive these guys, these, these hedge fund guys from New Jersey, and they'd, they'd really like to play in your game. I said, OK, great. Have them meet me at the Four Seasons Bar in Manhattan. Um, they walked in the door, and it was very clear to me they were not hedge fund guys. They looked like they had just rolled off the set of Goodfellas. They were really dressed the part. However, when I asked them if I could get them a drink, there was like, they, they broke the part because they ordered apple martinis. <laughs> I was like, really? It's not what they do in the movies. But they got to it really quickly and they said, look, you've been able to build something great. We don't want to take it from you, but you got to partner with us. Um, we'll help you collect. It'll be great, you know. Obviously, I cannot get into bed with the mob, right? I cannot partner with violent criminals. So I um, tried to explain this in, in the best way that I could, and uh, paid for their apple martinis, and I left. Um, and you know, I kept ducking their calls. And up until this point, you might be asking yourself, was this whole thing legal? And surprisingly, yes, it was, up until this point. Um, I had an event planning company. I paid my taxes. And I had criminal attorneys on both coasts that had analyzed the federal statutes and decided that Look, as long as you don't take a rake, meaning you don't act like Vegas, you don't take a percentage of each pot, um, and you're operating just on tips, it's legal. And I was making $5 million on tips. You know, I was doing really well. Keep in mind, I was also extending a lot of credit to these guys to be able to win millions of dollars. And basic supply and demand, nine seats, I get to invite the players. So it was a good system. But I was getting really reckless, and I was putting a lot of people in seats at this point that were shady debt, I, that I didn't know if I could collect from. And I was at one, one poker game, um, and there was $20 million on the table, and I looked around, and I had some pretty bad debt at that table. And so with one hand movement, movement I signaled my dealer to start taking a rake, and there was an FBI informant at that game. So um, that was all they needed. Uh, and they started to uh, tap my phone and listen to my phone. And, and uh, then I heard back from, I, I, you know, I, the, the Italians kept calling me, kept calling me. I avoided their calls, and that sort of came to roost um, in late 2010. It was around the holidays, and I um, 
<clears throat> got a knock at the door. I thought it was my doorman bringing up a package, and this is what happened. It's a hard scene, but it's difficult for me to sit up here and accurately characterize just how dark it had gotten. Um, because now, not only am I putting my own life in jeopardy now, I'm putting people I love's life in jeopardy. And so, um, and I couldn't tell anyone. I couldn't call the cops. I couldn't tell anyone. I just sat in my house and I let my face heal and I waited to talk to hear from them. And I didn't know what I was going to say because I didn't even know if it was an option anymore to turn this down. One week went by, two weeks, I didn't hear from them. On the third week, I got the New York Times. On the cover, it said 125 people arrested in the biggest mob-related takedown in New York City history. And I never heard from them again. But um, I think you can probably guess how this thing ends. I'm, you know, on the West Coast, a Ponzi scheme, celebrities playing in an illegal poker game. On the East Coast, politicians, Wall Street, all playing in an illegal poker game. Italian mob, Russian mob, all connected by Molly Bloom. So the feds came in. And um, it was uh, 2011, and they raided one of my poker games. I wasn't at that game. Um, they, I got a text from my poker dealer said, the FBI is here looking for you. And in that moment, I just wanted my mom badly. And so I, I didn't know if I was going to get arrested and thrown in jail forever. I mean, you just don't know when they say the FBI is looking for you what's going to happen. So I went home. I packed a bag, my ledger, and I got in the car, and I tried to buy a plane ticket out of JFK to Denver. And my credit card got declined. And my next credit card got declined. And I logged into my accounts, and they were all seized, frozen in the red. My balance read negative $9,999,099. <clears throat> um, the Fed said to my lawyers, yeah, we took her money in asset forfeiture. And if she wants to go on record and tell us how she made this money, we can talk. Well, I didn't want to do that. So, <laughs> so I went away. I moved back in with my mom. I didn't have a penny. I didn't even have a bank account. And I felt real sorry for myself. And uh, my mom came in finally after a couple weeks and said, enough. You need to go outside and get some fresh air. Because my mom thinks that fresh air will fix anything. <laughs> and um, I walked outside. My mom lives in the mountains, like in, in the mountains. And I walked outside and saw those mountains, you know, and it kind of broke something loose in me. Because I was raised on those mountains, and I was taught to get back up. And so I decided that um, I had to at least try to put it back together. So for two years, I um, tried to get a job. I got sober. And I moved back to LA, because uh, I finally got hired. It took me a while. Um, at a production company. And uh, I moved back into a little modest apartment. And, and five days after I moved back, two days before my birthday, <laughs> Um, I got a call in the middle of the night, and they said, this is agent so-and-so from the FBI. We're outside your apartment. You need to come outside with your hands up. I hadn't run a poker game in two years. I hadn't heard anything from the feds. I had, my lawyers hadn't, so I was a little bit uh, shook. I walked out into the hallway, and when my eyes uh, adjusted to the high beam flashlights, I saw 17 FBI agents with machine guns or semi-automatic weapons. I don't really know what kind of guns they were. They looked like machine guns. <laughs> And they put me in handcuffs. They put a piece of paper in front of me that said the United States of America versus Molly Bloom. Not a good day. <laughs> I had a day and a half to fly to New York, find an attorney that's going to represent me on my word that I'll pay them someday, and uh, represent me in the fight of my life. And I found a truly heroic attorney who said, what you do in the next couple moments, hours, days will dictate the rest of your life and I think you need help. And so I hired him, and uh, he took my IOU. <laughs> um, and I, he and I went to sit down with the prosecutors. And they said, look, you ran these high stakes illegal poker games for eight years uh, with celebrities, politicians, Wall Street titans. We think you know things that could help us. We're willing, if you're willing, to become a confidential informant. We're willing to give you all your money back and we're willing to give you full immunity. But if you're not, we're going to fight for real jail time. We're going to go for 10 years. So um, you know, I went home that night, and I tried to think about a million ways that I could justify doing this. But I couldn't, because these were my actions. I had profit. These people came and played in my game. I profited from them. I chose to break the law. And so um, I, couldn't, I couldn't justify 
telling on them to save my own butt. So um, I went in and I told the prosecutors that and they weren't happy and there was a lot of yelling and threats and that's how it goes. And I waited to get sentenced. And I made all the necessary preparations that one makes to go to jail, you know? And I walked into that courtroom and I got real lucky. It was a young liberal judge who was very disappointed in my life choices but said, I don't see the sense in overpopulating prisons with Molly Bloom. So, um, you know, I was massively relieved. But I'm sitting at dinner and one brother just graduated from Harvard and the other one just got inducted into the Sports Hall of Fame and like, I'm a convicted felon. <laughs> you know? And I was like, this has got to stop this dinner table. And I just decided right then and there that I was going to figure this out. And what, if any, were my monetizable assets? And I thought, you know what, maybe there's a story here. So I decided to write a book and then I decided um, that I would go find a really prolific screenwriter to write a movie. And my family's like, when are you going to get real? But I really believed in this. So um, I really liked Aaron Sorkin. I was a huge fan of The West Wing. And also, uh, from a gambling background, uh, Hollywood's a tough industry, full of failures. Really just a terrible bet. But if you bet on Aaron Sorkin, it's a good, strong bet. So I decided I needed to get an, a meeting with Aaron Sorkin. And I got that meeting after harassing almost every agent and manager in town. And um, they. Uh, they said, you have 60 minutes, and that's it. And so I pitched Aaron Sorkin, and he listened to me, and he kind of had this amused expression on his face. And when I was done, he said, wow, I've never met someone so down in their luck and so full of themselves. <laughs> <laughs> and he wrote the movie. And um, you know, I, uh, four years ago, I was pleading guilty in federal court. And last year, I got to go to the Oscars. So yeah. And, um, you know, poker's a lot like life and like a, lot, a lot like investing. You've got this set of information in front of you, uh, mathematics, statistics, odds. You have to read people, and then you have to make critical choices. And um, I watched some of the most successful people in the world for thousands of hours play this game. And these people were pretty evenly skilled. I tried to seat the table with, with, e with people with even skill sets. And yet, still, winners and losers emerged. And everyone thought it was luck. But I saw something different. There were three main factors that led to the winners winning and the losers losing. One, the winners played the long game. They understood that it was their number at the end of the year, or the end of five years, that mattered. And so they were good at folding. They were good at walking away when they were running cold. Number two, and this is a big one, the winners liked themselves. They were nicer people. They were nice to the dealers. They were better tippers. They were honest. And uh, the losers were kind of the opposite. And the last factor was the winners seemed to have an extraordinary uh, amount of mind control. They were able to stay out of ego and greed and fear and stay very composed in the chaos. They didn't really get on tilt that often. And so I really wanted to emulate these. You know, after I had some time when I moved in with my mom, and I thought, like, I need to put myself there. And the first thing I did was pretty simple, and I learned it in a 12-step program. At the end of the day, I just take an inventory. I look at my actions throughout the day, and if I owe an apology, I make that apology. And if there's things I need to work on, I work on them. And the second one is meditation. And if your mind just shut off when I said meditation, I get it. Because at first I thought, like, that would lead me to a monastic life with scratchy clothes and a bowl of rice, and that was not what I was interested in. But meditation has been the most profoundly transformative tool I have ever discovered in terms of uh, be, you know, mind control, being able to stay serene and calm in the eye of the storm. And uh, the last thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, unfortunately, we'll almost everyone has that fall from grace, that moment where it ends and you think it's over. And um, I know it's not. And I know that um, if you can walk through that fire, the, the opportunities that come from that are absolutely incredible. But the one thing that's necessary for that is hope. So I, hope, I, uh, I sincerely hope that I've been able to impart a bit of that today. It's been a real honor, you guys. Thank you.